Hey, welcome back future scientists. Today I'll be showing you how to separate a mixture of dyes using column chromatography. This is part three of four for our lab on identifying and separating a mixture of food coloring dyes. Column chromatography is similar to paper chromatography. There is a stationary phase and a mobile phase. The stationary phase is called packing material and it's going to be a solid that you put in. We're using silica in this case, though others are available. The mobile phase will still be the solvent, and we're going to use different solvents this time based on our results from last experiment, part two. So we'll be switching solvents in the middle, which is what the benefit of column chromatography is. You have a container, and the way that you set it up is at the bottom of the container in the opening, you first put a small piece of cotton, and then a small layer of sand. You put your packing material and then a top layer of sand. You use the dropper and put in some of your sample in the top. And as you add solvent, the mixture will be carried down, but the different components of the mixture will be carried down at different rates, similar to what we saw in paper chromatography. And you can collect them separately in a collection vessel at the bottom. Now, the paper chromatography we did was all about deciding which solvents to use. And so I put up my results from my mixture where the ethyl acetate did nothing, carried neither of them. The acetone also carried nothing and didn't separate them. But the isopropanol or the isopropyl alcohol moved the red dye and that should carry the red dye through my column, leaving the blue dye at the top. The ethanol moved the red and a little bit of the blue. The methanol moved both. And so if I use this to get all of the red out and collect it, there should be only blue left, and then I can use methanol to get the blue out. Now the thing that we're going to start with, we're going to actually prepare our column using acetone since it doesn't move either of the substances. So you want to start with your least polar solvent that doesn't do anything, and that's the first solvent that you're going to get your chromatography column wet with and prepare it. Then you move to more and more polar solvents after you apply your sample. Now the properties of silica are very similar but slightly different than paper, and so we might see some different results from the paper chromatography. We might see some of these solvents actually are able to move one of the dyes or both, and so we'll maybe have to do two trials, but we'll see, and we'll just keep our eyes on what's going on. Next I'll show you what this looks like, and I'll separate my mixture. These are the materials that you're going to need. I've got a paper clip, cotton ball, some forceps. These were my results from before. A scupula, my packing material, the silica, some sand, my solvents, and a larger sample of my base solvent that I'm going to start with. I've got a ring stand with what I'm going to use as my column, and I've got collection vessels. I've got five collection vessels because you're going to collect what drips out of your column in different containers. You're going to do one before any color comes through. You're going to do one when you see the first color come through. Then you switch solvents and you would collect what is coming out in the middle. You collect your second color, your second substance, and finally you do a tail collection. And what you do is you do that just so that if there's any faint color that comes out first, or faint color that comes out at the end, or faint color that comes out in the middle, you'll be able to test those. So it's however many things you're separating, plus one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. There are two ways to pack a column. I'm going to show you the faster, but not as optimum way called dry pack. And then I'll show you the slurry method, the best way to do this. Based on the time, you might choose to do a dry pack even though it's less than optimum, you still might be able to get okay results with it. Though I am going to actually run my column with the one that is prepared using the slurry method. So in the dry pack method, you're going to get just a small piece of cotton. You're going to ball it up until it's about the size of maybe a half a pea, a split pea. You're going to put it in the bottom of the column and you're going to use your paper clip now, you're going to unbend it. 
and you're going to use it to poke it into the hole, to poke the cotton ball into the hole. You're next going to apply a shallow layer of sand. You tap it to even it out, and then wet it with your base solvent, the solvent that you're going to start with, and that's, for me, acetone. Now, if you're doing dry pack, you're just going to add your packing material. The thicker the packing material layer, the slower it will run, but the better separation you will get. Tap it to level it, and then wet it with your base solvent. Now once all of your packing material is wet with your base solvent, you let it get just to the top before putting in a final layer of sand. Then lastly, you would wet the sand with your solvent. And your column would be ready to go. You would apply your mixture a few drops in the top, and after it soaks into the sand, you would add a few drops of your base solvent to get it out of the sand and into the packing material. And when performing column chromatography, it's best to have only a thin layer of your solvent at the top, but you do always want to have some at the top. You never want this to dry out. It can interfere with the flow of the mixture through the substances. So now I'll show you how to prepare this with the slurry method. Now, as I was moving things over, I started to realize that the acetone was not doing a good job separating these as well as I had hoped or as well as it showed on paper, that the blue is moving. The red is moving further, but the blue is moving as well. And so I'm going to, for my slurry method, change my starting solvent to ethyl acetate, something a little bit less polar, and see if I can get better results. We're gonna start off very similarly with the cotton going into the opening. Followed by a thin layer of sand. And I'm still going to wet the sand as I did before with my starting solvent. Now the difference with the slurry method is that instead of putting in the packing material dry, I'm actually going to pour in some of my starting solvent and stir it up, creating a slush or a slurry. And it's this that I'm going to be putting in. Once the dripping is stopped, then adding another thin layer of sand and wetting it with the solvent. And now once the solvent level is down to the top of the sand, I'm going to add a few drops of my mixture. Now I'm going to apply the solvent to get it through the sand. This bubble here is because I didn't evenly apply the sand. And we can see that, just like with the paper, the ethyl acetate does not seem to be carrying either dye through the sand much or through the packing material. And because there is no movement, I'm going to switch to my next solvent. 
moving in order to more polar from less. And so that would be acetone. I'm going to start getting ready to collect since I'm switching solvents to one that is supposed to move these substances. Now you can see that as I've started to add acetone, we have movement of the colors, the dyes. A little bit more here than what I would like. I think I'm going to still get a mixture at the end. It's not separating well through this path. There must have been an air bubble or something that let the dye through. What I'm looking for is for the color to reach the sand. At that point, I'm going to switch to a different collection vessel. Now every time a different color comes through or you switch solvents, that's when you should switch collection vessels. Now I think there were bubbles in the slurry method packing that I did and so I'm going to start collecting from the dry pack example because the layers came out much nicer. The red is definitely first. I'm going to try to collect some pure red out of this one while still seeing what I can get from here. This one definitely has some red to it. You can definitely see some red coming through here but I worry that some of the blue is gonna start coming through and so I'm gonna switch soon. Once the red is out of this, I'm going to switch solvents. I might switch to isopropyl alcohol next or ethanol or methanol. Though I know the methanol will definitely pull this out so I might go right to the methanol since this is fairly separate. This one is starting to look a little bit purple. I'm gonna switch and see if I can get just blue out if all of the red is out, which it seems like it might be. I'm gonna to switch to methanol for this to really draw out that blue. Now that it looks like the red is pretty much out, I'm going to switch to the next test tube for this one and start adding methanol to pull the blue out. With this one that I packed with the slurry method, with the ethyl acetate, you can see how much blue was retained in the sand at the top that the methanol is taking out. I really think that first bit of blue that came through that contaminated the early sample was just because I maybe pressed the pipette too hard when I was applying the mixture and it pushed some in. Since I forgot to label them earlier, I'm going to label them now as I'm waiting for the blue to come out. I'm going to switch test tubes again here once the blue gets down to the bottom of the packing material, and I'm going to switch here once the blue gets to the bottom of the packing material. You can see here some of the blue is starting to drip out and be collected. We have definitely some red and then some purple here. Still waiting on the blue to reach the bottom here.
Now the drops coming out of here look like they're pretty colorless at this point, and so I'm going to switch to the last test tube. And this one looks like the color might almost be ready, so I'm going to switch to the next one. And just a little bit of faint blue left coming through. And we can see some of the blue color starting to appear here. So this one has lost all of its color through the column, through the packing material, and so this is complete. We're just waiting on this one. Now this has pretty much run its course. So this is the end of part three. We've got our colors separated. We've got some red here and some blue here that were mixed together as purple before. Part four is going to be letting these things be put back into the spectrophotometer to test them. See if there's any hints of blue in here or any hints of red here using the computer. We're gonna have to wait on that because we need to let these solvents evaporate, leaving only the color behind. The solvents themselves could damage or dissolve the plastic cuvettes. For here, we're going to see if any of this is pure red, how much blue contaminated this, and see if this is pure blue or if any of the red is contaminating here, just how well we did separating them. Well, thanks for watching. Good luck on your own. Make sure you don't make any of the mistakes that I did, and I think you'll have great success.